Hey you guys, today we're going to look at some very interesting traps that you can try out against one D4. So the first trap that you always and always have to keep in mind is the one that occurs in the Banco Gambit. Now this is where you start with knight f6 and 90% of your opponents are going to play pawn to c4, hoping to enter into the lines of the QGD. Let's say if you play pawn to d5 or e6. By the way, you can also play g6 or knight c6 in this position, which is called the Mexican defense. A very interesting line that I covered a few months ago, and you can find that video in the link, which is in the description. But here the move that I'm talking about is pawn to c5 right away. This is called the Benoni defense, and d5 is what you're going to see most of your opponents playing, after which I recommend you go pawn to b5. And now we are playing the Benko Gambit. The whole idea of the Benko Gambit is to allow white to take the b5 pawn after which we play pawn to a6 giving them a second pawn to open up some lines for quick development this is also played by super gms and other grandmasters by the way if you are looking for a main weapon against d4 even in classical games tournament games i recommend the Benko gambit it is a very sharp opening which you guys can try out against d4 and c4 anyways Having known how dangerous the Bengal Gambit can be, you are going to see most of your opponents playing pawn to b3, which is one of the ways to decline the Bengal Gambit. White just wants to open up this diagonal for his dark squared bishop, and we're going to see how that works. So here I recommend you just take the pawn on c4, after which they are going to take back with their b pawn, and then you go pawn to g6. Now wait a second, pawn to d6 is very much okay in this position, but Speaking of psychology chess, you guys, we are not robots, okay? And your opponents are just mere human beings prone to error. So if you start with pawn to g6 first, your human opponents will be tempted to play bishop b2 right away, which is the top played move in this position. And that's what we want to see. The problem with d6 is that white could have played something else like knight to f3 or pawn to e3, I don't know, or just some other developing move. But the moment you play pawn to g6, they will be tempted to play bishop b2 indirectly by bowling your lonely rook on h8. So this is a psychological move, okay? And now you play bishop g7. Oh, this is when most of them play knight c3. But once again, the top played move according to the Leeches database, is knight d2. And again, instead of castling short, this is when you play another psychological move, pawn to d6, delaying castling short on purpose. Because with this move, we are giving white one more chance to blunder with the move knight to e4, which attacks our knight on f6 and indirectly our undefended bishop on g7. This is exactly what we planned for and what we wanted to see. So the moment you see this move, just know that this is a blunder and white should be preparing to pack his bag and go out for shopping. So we first of all take this knight. That's a very interesting move. Let them take, thinking they are attacking our lonely rook on h8 and stopping us from castling short. But the game is over after queen a5 check. And as you can see, there's nothing that white can do here. We're just going to take even that bishop on c3 with check again. The only thing that can stop us from checkmating is if white blocks the check with his hands or his fingers. Otherwise, queen d2 doesn't work either because... Queen takes d2 is checkmate. Now, whenever I see this trap, I'm always reminded of the elephant gambit, you guys, which I covered in the video that has popped up in the card above. But just in case some of you guys are lost, let me quickly show you how that goes. So white starts with d4, and then we respond with d5. If c4, which is what we want, the queen's gambit, now we go pawn to e6, knight c3, all normal stuff, and then white plays bishop g5. This is the first sign that our elephant gambit might work. So we go knight bd7. This is where our queen's knight belongs to, okay? Our queen's knight sits on d7 most of the times. So the moment you see white taking on d5, there's a probability that they might take the second pawn because they don't know what they are doing. And this is when we simply capture this free knight on d5, completely giving up on d8. So that if white takes, well, we can simply go bishop b4 check. And once again, the only thing that can stop us from winning white's queen is if 
white blocks with his hands. Oh, probably his elbow. But we can still shake his eyeballs by taking the dark squared bishop. Because we have all the time in this world to take his queen and making them lose their right to castle as well. We'll continue our development. And from here, we are going to have a normal game, you guys. So that's just a little trap in the queen's gambit called the elephant trap. Let's move on to the next trap. Okay, so white starts with pawn to d4. But hey, do you know that instead of starting with knight to f6, we can also begin with pawn to c5 right away. And if d5, we can still go knight f6, then they play c4, we play the same Benko Gambit, back to the same trap that we talked about. But see, if your opponent knows that you are a Benko Gambit player, they might play something like pawn to c4 here, which is the second top played move, by the way, because they don't want to face your Benko Gambit. So this is why I suggest that you just take the pawn on d4 with your c pawn, and the whole idea of the Benko Gambit, you guys, in case you didn't know, is to secure your king and start attacking from the queen side. This is what we call the minority attack, okay? We'll develop all our king side pieces on their natural squares, play pawn to e6, maybe pawn to d5 will come later on. I don't know, but the whole idea is to begin our game from the queen side, okay? This is where our game will be, starting with a minority attack, probably a6 and b5. But anyways, after c takes d4, you won't see most of your opponents, especially advanced opponents, taking on d4. Why? Because they think... They are going to help you develop your queen's knight with tempo. So you develop this knight while attacking their queen and they will have to go back and then you continue your development. As a result, you are going to be ahead in development. And they don't want to lose that tempo. That's why they start with knight to f3 because they know that anyways, this d4 pawn is lost. Now, this is where you play pawn to e5, you guys. Defending your pawn on d4. And just like you thought, trust me, over 45,000 people have blundered in this same position by taking on e5 with their knight. And you may have thought of the same, but let me just show you what happens. Knight takes e5 calls for our signature move. Queen a5 check. Because even if white blocks with his toes, we have queen takes e5, winning their knight and shaking their eyeballs once again. By the way, this is a cool move. After pawn to g3, we simply play queen e4, provoking another weakness, let's say pawn to f3. Because we have queen e6, again, trying to invite another weakness, pawn to b3. Now look at these dark square weaknesses plus these two white square weaknesses here. This is how we play chess, you guys. Just be putting your pieces on the most active squares if you run out of moves or ideas. Next, we'll play knight to f6, bishop g2, and then we play knight c6. Let them cast a shot. We have bishop c5 intending to go pawn to d3. That will be an open check. If they play king h1, we just cast a shot. See how active our position is. Next, we are going to play pawn to a5, pawn to d5. We open up the lines. I mean, I'm just wasting your time with this. Let's look at another baby trap. So once again, d4. Then we play c5 instead of knight f6. Another way of trying to run away from the Benko Gambit is when white plays d takes c5 right away at worst we always have this signature move queen a5 check winning the pawn on c5 but hey it's a free world we can play e6 here because taking this pawn with a bishop is even better and trust me if you're playing against amateur players here they are going to play pawn to b4 trying to hold on to their c pawn just continue with your minority attack pawn to a5. If they play c3, that's an indication that they don't know what they're doing. You're going to take, and after they take, what do you do again? Queen f6. The only thing that can stop us from capturing the rook is if they decide to play bishop b2 or knight c3. After which we just take the knight with check and they have to block with their bishop. We have many squares to go to. Queen b3 is my favorite. Still staying in my opponent's territory. This will give them a lot of pressure by the way. And whenever you see knight to f3, just remember to play knight c6. At least stopping them from occupying the e5 square. Not to mention that with this move, we are now double attacking the pawn on b4. And that's why they play queen b1, defending this pawn twice with their bishop. And what do we do? Again, the minority attack. So at the end of the day, you guys, even though this video is about 
traps. A wise man here should learn that what I'm really preaching about is the minority attack. So always keep this in mind. When you have a few number of pawns on one side of the board, get rid of them as quickly as you can. That's called the minority attack in order to open up some lines, okay? Where your big pieces are going to be sitting. So let them take, cause we have bishop takes b4. And after they take, well, they're just helping us to position our pieces on the most active squares. Next, we are going to go queen c3 check. And we also have knight c2 check in some instances. For example, if they play queen c1 intending to exchange queens and also stopping us from playing queen c3 check. Well, we have queen a5, a tricky move as if we want to win this pawn. So that if they play e3 while well, the queen falls after this discovery. All right, guys, I think this is all for today. And I hope you learned something. The biggest lesson that I got from this study I mean, when I was creating it, is the minority attack. Even as content creators tend to forget some of these things. We are only human beings. That's one thing that many content creators cannot tell you. And I'm telling you now to remind you that we are not robots. Even grandmasters do forget some of the lines that they already know because sometimes the mind gets tired, you guys. So the minority attack is something that you must walk away with from this study. If at all these traps sounded so cheap to you. All right, with this being said, if at all you enjoyed watching this video, please don't forget to click the like button or hit that like button. Share this video if you can and subscribe to my channel if at all you haven't already because that's how you encourage me to keep on making these wonderful traps. All right, until next time.